off by saying that uh, I love this momentum of web development. It's like it's very challenging for us. It's hard. It's moving fast. It's making a lot of people think like uh, more about their users, and it makes sense. The responsive web design just makes sense to me, and that's why I love. Uh, working on this and speaking about this. So, what is responsive? Let's just define the word responsive. Uh, I look it up at the dictionary.com and it, there are definitions of word in the English language. is to react quickly and positively. So, and I want to make emphasis on the positively part of the definition, because if it's not positive, it's not responsive. So if we put this definition into the web development world, we'll get something like, uh, responsive web design is a design approach that aims to create interfaces that quickly adapt or react positively to the user's situation and this is great it's all positive it's welcoming for the user it makes us work better for them uh, so how do we get to work on this there is currently hundreds thousands of resources out there to work with responsive from CSS3 and you know, the new HTML5 uh, features, uh, JavaScript libraries, frameworks, conferences like this, blog posts, magazines, everything. There is a lot of resources. So when you have to decide on what to pick to solve a, sol a, pr a problem on the responsive web design, you'll find like probably too many options and it's really hard to decide which is the best for the project you're working on. So, and what I do to, to pick the best solution is make a list of the features and the plugins that I probably need on the project to understand what the needs are for that particular project. From there, I answer myself uh, a few questions. I think those lights are not going right. <laughs> yeah, probably. I have my nose here because my brain has been tricking me today. Features that I want to use, I go through this question myself to define if the proposed solution is the best one. First is what options are available to solve this problem. Second, can I do it myself instead of using an off-the-shelf solution? Third, does this solution work in every device I'm making my project? Does it have a fallback for all the browsers? How's it going to work when the browser doesn't understand what the plugin is doing? And there is another one at the end that doesn't show. <laughs> Say, does it really make the user experience better? And after I answer all these questions, I get a better panorama to decide whether or not to use this particular plugin or library, or if I can do it myself, or if I can pick something else. It's important that we decide always on research and not just pick the first thing that comes up because we don't know how it's going to react in all the situations that might appear. The second topic will be about performance. We 
The performance affects everybody. There's thousands of devices out there from create, uh, cheap Android phones to all computers with small screens, all the way to big screens, and we don't know much about them. There, there can be uh, users connecting their cell phones and their tablets to a high fiber optic internet connection. There can be a powerful MacBook Pro connected to a mobile hotspot. We don't know. A big screen doesn't mean a better connection. A small screen doesn't mean a crappy connection. So we can't assume things like, if the screen is big, it's a desktop, so it has a better connection, so I'm going to throw all this JavaScript and all this CSS there. It doesn't work like that. And it's not always about speed and data caps. It's about processor power. It's about memory. It's about um, battery life, sometimes. Every time your phone has to deal with all these animations and interfaces, it loses battery life. And that's very important for the user. Sometimes we don't think about that. So, performance is, I think, the main feature that we need to think when we decide to pick a solution for a problem on responsive web design. Yeah, we sometimes overcomplicate things and try to put everything because it's new. There's a new plugin and it looks shiny. Oh, it's so beautiful. Well, I want to use it everywhere. And many times these decisions make the user not have the best experience they can get. We have to think about them. So making decisions on research is always the best option to get the best out of the technology available today. And like I said, it's good for any project, but it's a must for responsive. Second topic is about flexibility. We, as developers, I, I was going to say before that we developers are usually lazy. We like to create these libraries and things to not have to work from scratch every time. And then I realized, no, we're not lazy. We, are, we like to save resources. We like to be efficient. We like to be faster. So that's why we create all these libraries. That's why those frameworks are everywhere now. There's Twitter Bootstrap, there's Foundation, there's Grids this and Grid that. And the only problem with those frameworks that you can find everywhere is that they are always trying to solve everything. They have <coughs> styles for every single element that you can imagine. They have plugins and all kinds of things that you probably don't need for every project. And they are so big that you probably don't know what's in every single line. For example, the Twitter Bootstrap has 7,000 lines of code. And for every point, you probably don't need half of that. Are you going to read every single line to know what you can get out and what you can't? You don't do that. You just use it. So, it's, we need to understand that sometimes creating our own libraries and writing our own code will give us a lot more flexibility to know what we can get out of the language, out of the uh, solution, or how can we better uh, find a solution for a problem. The uh, frameworks don't help us with that. Actually, they, make, they usually make us more uh, lazy. The way people, uh, I noticed that the way people are using uh, frameworks now is they, for example, the Twitter bootstrap, you download it, you include it in your HTML, and then you put another file overriding half of the, what the framework is doing. Because they are becoming what Eric Mayer said about it's his 
uh, reset that is uh, stops contain the black box of no touchiness that you can touch because if you touch the framework then you can update it. If you change it or, or, or you will say I'm not going to update it because I changed it and I'm going to lose my changes or I'm not going to uh, change it because then I'm going to be able to update it and then you end up overriding half of the rules. So it's like why are you using that framework? Um, If the framework that you will try to use is not going to be exactly what you need, you will be better off not using it. Create your own thing. You don't have to write it all from scratch. You can use pieces of the framework if you know what they're doing. I would recommend to everybody to, if you work, write code. Write your own code and write your own framework because it will make you understand everything, how it works, and it will make you know when to use each part and how to optimize and how the output at the end is going to be the best you can get of your code. The next topic is accessibility. One of the problems with the frameworks is that they rely sometimes too much in JavaScript. Uh, when you need to use uh, collapsible elements, uh, accordions, carousels, or maybe even a simple responsive menu navigation. They use inline JavaScript to change the way that the menu is displayed, and that is not good. JavaScript is not for styling, JavaScript is not for display. You need to use JavaScript to change the status of the components and use CSS to change the styles. That's accessibility. By doing this, we, we always have to assume that the users have the less capable device. Um, I remember in, in the Smashing Conference last year, Jane Archibald said that there is no, no JavaScript users. Nobody has JavaScript until JavaScript is loaded. And sometimes the user is faster than the JavaScript being loaded in the browser. So, always try to leave JS only to change the status. That's the most important part of this uh, section here. The next section is about control. We, we need to have control over code. When you use a framework that you don't know who wrote it, you don't know why they named their classes the way they did, you don't have control over it. When you work in a team, or even more, when you lead a team of developers, you have to be able to answer their questions. You have to be able to be challenged about the code. You have to be able to change if you need. And to be able to do that, you have to know your code. It's getting loud. Or I'm getting closer. <laughs> The last section about this is about standards. We, we love standards. Standards make us be organized. That's when, when we don't usually are uh, organized. It's not only about the web standards, the W3C and, and using the right elements and the right tags and all that. It's about procedures. It's about our own process to write our own standards to know, for example, to have a file structure that you can use in every project that you know it works for you, it makes sense to you, to your company. And to know what names are you going to put to your classes in every project so you can reuse the same elements over and over without having to rewrite. And the way you organize your 
files and your little code snippets. All of these standards are basic to responsive web design because we kind of double the code we use, the CSS code we use from previous um, approaches to web design. With responsive, we write twice as much code, sometimes three times as much code, and it can get messy really quick. And if you don't have the standards to save things and, and, and to organize all your files and class names and modules and elements, you can get it, if, when, if you're working with a big responsive side, it can get messy real bad. So a standards is, is uh, the way to go. that we can do for uh, help with the standards is when you start working with a project, it makes sense to have a style guide that you can have all your elements with the CSS and you can see how they respond to the browser and make the changes necessary in, in one single file with all the components and then from there you copy the components to their respective sections of the website. You can use the style guide to debug CSS and JavaScript. You can use the style guide to show clients uh, the look and feel of the project will be and how they will respond each section to the browser size and even to the interaction in smaller devices and touch devices. And it makes us more organized in general. So when I was looking at the definition of responsive, I came across these three words. There were synonyms of the word responsive. And I thought it was important to show them because these three words, if we keep these three words in our mind when we are making development and design decisions, they will make us think about our users be receptive, understanding, and sympathetic with the design and development decisions we're making, we for sure are gonna have happier user because we're gonna be meeting their needs. Caring is loving. Thank you very much.